Okay, everybody. Remember, I'm a guy who doesn't like World War II, supposedly. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to do this mostly off the cuff. Looking at all the grand strategic World War II stuff I have and combining in you know, some things that maybe don't really belong uh, because you have to remember I did the prequel stuff uh, you know gathering storm and days of decision over here so, let's flip some of these down and start dealing with them as best as I can all right so as far as I'm concerned it all started with third row well, I don't know. This may predate their break. But we'll hold on that. Because that's really just there as a comparison and a brief discussion in relationship to um, some of the other prequel games. And it really doesn't serve its purpose except to say, you know, when I played Third Reich, my first thought was, hey, can I use Origins of World War II to generate a Third Reich scenario? And the answer is no. Uh, but now you have Gathering Storm, which allows you to do that for what Third Reich's become. And maybe for Advanced Third Reich as well, uh, for whatever that's worth. Okay. So, the first thing is, World War II, you know, back when I got Third Reich was uh, the cat's meow for me. It wasn't necessarily the best and most interesting period, but it was a pretty big thing for me and it's become much much less in you know by the time I reached 2025 20, I was much much less into World War II but alright we're gonna need another pipe and this is gonna be several sections so. even though World War II isn't a big focus of my interest anymore particularly the strategic side of it does still hold my interest more than any other part of World War II. And to tell you the truth, the operational never really excited me much, and the tactical even less. Uh, that's because you can't picture what's going on in the tactical. But the strategic has always held a certain level of interest to me, and uh, you know, World War I doesn't interest me on the tactical terribly much either. Okay, what about all these different games? What is each one's strong point, weak point, whatever? What can I capture from them? Well, one thing you have to realize is it's been a hell of a long time since I played Axis Empire. Uh, I had a, and I have a, I only played it the once, and well, more than once because I played some demo, you know, some some of the learning scenarios. But that's kind of fading, and I tried to remind myself. But then I realized, wow, unconditional surrender is even kind of fading. That was just uh, a, a two years ago that I played it or something. I don't know. Um, Whereas some of these others, I probably could have spoken about, you know, Third Reich, Advanced Third Reich, Days of Decision, World in Flames, I probably could have spoken about fairly well without having played them recently, but I wanted to make sure I got them out of the way. I was hoping to play uh, the Axis Empires games again, but the fact that the expansion hasn't come out and is never going to probably be due to come out makes it kind of more difficult for me. I really wanted to see the random scenario generator and play and such. Um, okay, so starting from the Third Reich uh, stance, and I don't have that sitting here. Uh, my copy is off in special places that I haven't seen for more than half my life. Um, what you had there was this grand strategic game for Europe. And it was at a fairly abstract level, but still was more detailed and more complex than pretty much anything else out there for its time. But it caused a, a sort of bouncing about uh, of ideas, you know, and slowly as it got refined as a more and more competitive game, some players played it very, very competitively, uh, flaws in the system were discovered, things were tweaked. 
rules changed, etc. And you got to the point where people were saying, you know, it's it, it's an overburdened system with a lot of you know special cases already baked into it for you know when the Russians can attack and when they can't this that and the other. And that's really when uh, Rowland came up with uh, World in Flames. Okay. So there was then, and I discussed this I think both in my World in Flames and my uh, World of War coverage, uh, this balancing back and forth of ideas between the two games. And they're really based on the same design principle. Uh, l well, in one same design principle, which is sort of this, okay, we're fairly heavily focused on the military. Anything else that's present is going to kind of be secondary to that. So, you know, Third Reich had option shits, which might give you better technology, or they might give you some diplomatic changes, but you were playing almost, you know, you were playing World War II. Uh, the Germans got to call in their minor allies when they wanted, etc. Well, some of that changed in World in Flames. They added a diplomacy system, they a very minor one. Um, did they? I seem to remember there were diplomacy points in it, but maybe I'm, I'm mistaken there. Uh, that, that too may have had this very scripted uh, situation in World War II. But it wasn't scripted in terms of what you did. You were fairly free in both these systems to make the command decisions you wanted. And you could really make World War II change in its tenor. You could get, get off a sea line in either game. Uh, you could knock Russia out of the war, or Britain. And they, I don't believe, came back. A little before uh, World in Flames came out, I think, came this one, which looks at a very, very different design decision. It starts you at the beginning of the war. And it keeps you fairly scripted in the sense that, uh, you know, you, you're going to have the Russians attack when they, you know, are feeling strong enough to attack. That's, that's been the balancing factor in almost all of these, which is, okay, the Nazi-Soviet pact exists, but, and the Russians will follow it up until they can, like, build up or hit a certain date or whatever, and then they can attack the Germans. So the Germans are on a timer, and they have to attack the Soviets. And whatever they can get done before that, or, or they will be attacked, and that's probably to their disadvantage. Um, what Hitler's war took as its determination was not thinking so heavily on the military side of things, but instead moving towards... Um, Let's worry more about what happens in terms of uh, the research side of the game. So all of your units in Hitler's War can be made better by reducing their costs, so you can build more of them. The actual combat and, and movement system is all integrated, which is kind of an interesting thing when we start to see the that's going to come up, uh, integrated combat and movement, over here at least. Uh, uh, with some, some little strange changes where you can like, where you actually are paying for your movement. That was a cool thing in Unconditional Surrender. I don't think that existed over in uh, Axis Empires. Um, but in Hitler's War, uh, essentially, you had this weird design and the military side of Hitler's war didn't really work. What ends up happening instead is this weird uh, situation where you're able to like create these huge pockets, and that becomes the whole goal of the game, especially in the East Front. Now, uh, Hitler's war is an interesting game, but it ended up being what I termed World War Silly, because it was just so weird what would happen in it. 
Uh, moving forward, we got to a couple of games that, well, one game that started to decide, and that's over here on the World in Flames side, Days of Decision, which said, hey, you know, not only are we giving you a really detailed military game, but we're also going to give you uh, a prequel to the war. And the only game that had done that before was Origins of World War II, which was very abstract and political placement and you're aiming for victory points, sort of this, this total mash of victory points that you just have this chart that you're looking at. Well, Days of Decision instead was really written to be a setup for World in Flames. Now, the Days of Decision that I have here, which is, I think, two, is more of a standalone game. And like Hitler's War, it's actually a three-sided game. Um, that's one of the exciting things about Hitler's War. Most of these World War II games are two-sided. Axis versus Allies. Bang, that's what you are. And maybe there's some way of differentiating between multiple people on one side who actually won. Okay. So, uh, that's kind of what Days of Decision brings into the World in Flames universe here. And for the longest time, the Third Reich universe didn't have anything like that. It will, but uh, we weren't too impressed with that in a lot of ways. Well, the next bounce was over here to advance Third Reich, which took some of the Days of Decision's ideas but mainly uh, what it did was started to bring a unified political system in terms of uh, uh, you, you applied points to, to your diplomacy and you tried to sway the different powers. That was one big factor in it. Uh, I'm trying to think what else really changed with Advanced Third Reich. One of the things is the map was just beautiful. It's essentially the same, I don't to pull stuff out, but it's essentially the same map that you would have seen in my World of War video, except it's on this really beautiful paper that's like got texture, and, you know, uh, heavy paper map. Now, that was weird because Avalon Hill doing a paper map, they didn't do many of them. Uh, they did the longest day on mounted maps, which of course makes it worth a fortune nowadays or whatever because it's such a, an excess, but Anyway, uh, these w one of the things they did with the map was they blew it up and made it uh, larger hexes, which was kind of a weird thing. Third Reich always kind of fit on a small table, and now it has become a monster game and the same size map, more or less. They did add some space to it. But one of the reasons Third Reich was important was it was able to make some changes that led them to believe that they could go forward with Empire of the Rising Sun. It didn't cover everything that was necessary, though. So Empire of the Rising Sun started working into a detailed naval system. And this is one of the things. So World in Flames goes into all of this detail on the ground system. Um, all the units are different values. Uh, the air units all have their own values and they're related by year. So modifiers that you end up getting in, thir in advanced Third Reich and a world at war, which come from technology increases perhaps. Okay, you don't have technology in advanced Third Reich, but you do in Empire of the Rising Sun if you play them together. And you definitely do in a world at war no matter how you play. Um, the technology in World in Flames is done by, you add units to your force pool each year, and you're allowed to also remove units as they get older or as they get destroyed. And that allows you to kind of trim your force pool. And this is important because you, your force pool in the Third Reich system is what you want to buy. You just have piles of units, you pay for them, you put them on the board. Once you get to the world at war, you start developing your force pool where you can make it bigger based on research uh, issues. Uh, instead, the world in flame system, 
uses, you just get these units in your force pool and your technology is going to be derived and decided by which things you remove from your force pool, which is essentially making the total amount of units you could build smaller. But in general, you can't build all your units in World of Flame. In Third Reich, you could build all your units. In here, who knows? It depends on you know how aggressively you build up your force pool. Uh, I'm gonna have to swap batteries. Okay, let's keep looking. Now, what about, uh, since we talked about technology in Hitler's war, uh, somewhat in a world at war and, and advanced third right, where you're actually building up a modifier to your combat by doing technology. And in days of decision, well, world and flames combination, what about some of these others? Well, to look at some of the others, you have to kind of understand the principles behind the game. Now, unconditional surrender, geez, I don't remember if it, how it handles it. I think what it has is chits that come into play over time um, that essentially work as your technologies, uh, if I recall correctly. Like, you get additional subs or something like that. Um, and, and yeah, you get markers like tanks and subs and stuff. You don't have a lot of control over them. I think they came over uh, simply by dates. They just kind of are programmed in. Yeah, I know. This is a lot to try to catch across it. Now, with the Axis Empires... What you have to understand uh, with that game is that it manages everything by cards, basically. It's not a CDG. You have this deck of cards that are the things that were done or could have been done. And quite often you have to, you, you, you have, um, you're forced to play a card each turn, I believe. Um, and some of them are major offensives and stuff that give you additional abilities. Some of them are production type things that give you additional forces, including technological growth. So that's kind of how I believe that was baked in in there. Um, there was a certain scripting to that whole card element to the Axis Empire's uh, design. Now, I'm having a lot of trouble with that one in particular because it's been so long since I played it. I did review my uh, my video for it, videos for it a little bit, but uh, there there are aspects that I don't remember very well at all. One thing that I remember uh, for both it and unconditional surrender, and they both involve Sal Vasta, by the way. He wrote unconditional surrender after he worked on the Axis Empires team is that combat in that game, uh, in, in Axis Empires, was fairly detailed um, in terms of the ground combat. But the support units, the air and the naval, were very, very abstract. Maybe even more so than in Third Reich. And the land combat was maybe more detailed than it was in Third Reich. Days of Decision, of course, is more detailed than both. Days of Decision for Naval Combat, uh, I'm sorry, World in Flames for Naval Combat, is sort of this weird mix, and I go into this when I'm talking on the World at War video. A World at War and the Advanced, uh, the Empire of the Rising Sun, come up with a more detailed naval system where you're actually in a hex and your patrol has range and everything. Whereas in the World in Flames system, the naval movement in combat is kind of area-based. It has this weird timer on it, and it's all fairly abstract. But these two games get even more abstract. Um, you're essentially, in Axis Empires, bidding chits against each other. And there was something somewhat similar to that in Unconditional Surrender, if I recall correctly. where you're rolling on these things. I'm trying to see, you have like, uh, you have these naval action shits. And 
they're again fairly abstracted based on uh, what is going on in it. So this one's this one's blurring for me too. <laughs> I don't think I can ever reasonably do this because most of these games are so big. So that's another issue. What is the time on all of these? Well, width is probably the longest of them all. The others, World at War, Unconditional Surrender, Axis Empires, probably all run yeah, probably close to 50 hours. Uh, Whiff is probably longer than that with the edition that I have. The earlier editions may come in uh, even lower than that 50 hours, but they're still long. Uh, I, I was mistaken. I used to think Whiff was fairly short. On the other hand, these two guys are in their own little world here because these are both playable really in an evening. Uh, Triumph and Tragedy is four to six hours. Hitler's War is a little longer. If you're playing the full thing, it might not take that long, but uh, I mean, it might be in the four to six hour range, but I've found it usually takes more like eight to ten. Uh, I'm always finding myself thinking it's going to be a reasonable size game that you can play in one sitting very easily and it ends up not being that. Um, okay. So... <laughs> I'm trying to think of something else uh, to say. Uh, what about the prequels that these have? Well, Axis Empires right now doesn't have a prequel, but Total or Krieg did. Um, and as far as I can tell from it, it's basically a random scenario generator rather than something that you really get to play. <sighs> Gathering Storm, and I, I, it w would only be in Europe for, Axis Empire, for uh, Total or Creek, obviously. You could probably translate it over. It might affect some of the cards, though. Gathering Storm is a World at Wars prequel, and it's just released this year. Um, It allows you to make quite a few decisions based on what you're going to produce, etc. It's very much a game of its own, though, and I think it's quite possible to play Gathering Storm, come up with one side winning, and then have the other side win uh, if you play it out on a World at War, simply because the victory conditions for Gathering Storm don't really relate to what necessarily works in a world of war. You could set yourself up with something that on paper looks good in Gathering Storm, but doesn't work very well at all when you're actually playing it out. Uh, and we kind of actually saw that in my game of a world at war, where lots and lots of Italian aircraft carriers and their planes were unable to make good airstrikes because they didn't have enough aircraft technology. Days of Decision, uh, at least the Days of Decision 2 version. The Days of Decision 1 was basically a set of cards and you made certain choice selections that would help you set up your World in Flames game. And I don't think it was a, play, a standalone game. Days of Decision two and three are standalone games and they look surprisingly a lot like Whiff Blitz does, uh, except they have a longer scan, uh, time span. What's kind of interesting about these is they actually serve as a wrapper to your game of World in Flames. Um, if you want to play them as the prequel to World in Flames, you can do that. But no matter what's going on, you continue playing Days of Decision alongside your World in Flames game. That's something that doesn't happen with Gathering Storm. Among other things, Gathering Storm doesn't even handle the Pacific at all, which was one of my biggest gripes about it when I first looked at it. And then I learned there were other things to gripe about that are even greater. Uh, Days of Decision gives you a true sandbox 
level to World in Flames, where you're able to, using some optional rules, etc., you're able to realign the countries, you're able to do stuff, uh, you, you don't have to go into China as Japan, for example. Something you're forced, you're forced into the 1939 setup for Japan, because Gathering Storm doesn't do anything there. Um, let me think what else we have to talk about. We haven't talked too much about diplomacy. Uh, unconditional surrender. You get diplomacy chits. Um, I'm not sure how they get activated, but essentially you're drawing from a cup to see whether or not you get to do diplomacy or not. With Axis Empires, your diplomacy is driven by the strategy cards you pick or, or choose to play. So if you play a certain strategy card, that allows you to go over to some tables and roll up some diplomatic effects. Diplomacy in a world at war is handled by, um, you get a certain number of dip points each turn based on your situation both on the board and your economic situation. And you can spend those on countries and then you make die rolls and you're allowed to trigger those die rolls throughout play, uh, a limited number of them. Now over on Gathering Storm, it of course worked with a completely different system because they're not meant to integrate in the same way. Uh, that system involved playing your production tiles essentially. Uh, production tiles is a lot you had these activity tiles that you can throw into countries to help sway them to your side uh, as, as almost a straight bid, you know, as a straight bid. Uh, Days of Decision handles diplomacy, um, and World in Flames really doesn't. Uh, Days of Decision handles it by the actions you take. Everything that you do in Days of Decision ends up affecting every country on the board, basically. So you're constantly um, throwing chits in to see, uh, in terms of how heavily you're influencing a particular country. And then what you're allowed to do is, uh, each turn that you get an activation, you're allowed to kind of trigger a country, any country, and all its chits get assessed at that point. <laughs> and all take effect, um, which can throw the country into your hands or give you economic penetration or whatever. <sighs> all right, we haven't talked much. There is no diplomacy in Hitler's war. We haven't talked much about Triumph and Tragedy. That's the one I just finished. And I've tried to give kind of a feel about all the others. This is kind of a weird one. First of all, it's a block game. No, I hate block games, but um, much more importantly, is the driving of the action in this game. It also uses cards. Uh, the way that it uses the cards, though, is that um, you have production at the beginning of your, of your turn uh, based on your economic, you know, resources, etc., in a way that's actually kind of reminiscent of, day, of uh, World in Flames, where you have to match things together, essentially. It's got a cleaner way of describing it and enacting it. Um, and then you use those points kind of on a one-for-one -one basis to activate, uh, to, to either generate new units or to buy one of two types of cards. Those cards are production, or, which also include your tech research and um, diplomatic cards which are also your command cards if you want to move your units on the board. So you've got this really kind of intertwined system there. And uh, for the diplomacy side of things, essentially you're just playing cards one at a time to bid on the countries uh, over that. For the tech side of things, you're also just matching cards together to create the technologies. Um, at the same time, though, you've got your industrial advancement. And uh, 
other games allow for a certain level of industrial advancement, so let's go into that. <laughs> the old Third Reich, the way it happened was, it was one of the first games that kind of had resource points in it. Uh, you had these basic resource points, you had a pile of them, and you got a percentage of them at the end of every year. Whatever you had left, you got a percentage added on to your base, so you would score more each year. You would have more money each year. They had to keep that system in place as they worked through the advanced Third Reich World at War. And what they did, though, was um, they added the concept of mobilizations uh, to it, which allow you to generalize uh, U.S. entry a little better. And it actually works in well with Gathering Storm, which uses the concept but in a slightly different way fashion. And the mobilizations would give you additional forces and additional money into your BRP pool. But it kept the, the same basic system. Days of Decision uses a system where you combine um, factories and resources. Okay, And you have to pair them up and you have to transit the resources to the factories using your convoys. And that's all becoming very, very intuitive, right? Because it's really matching the details of the reality. Okay, I don't remember how Axis Empires handles uh, production at all. Um, unconditional surrender. Sal Vasta took the idea that, you know, all these World War II games overemphasize how much conquered territory was worth. You get some bonuses from conquering certain things in Unconditional Surrender, but it's much, much less than you get in these other games. In most of these games, conquering stuff gives you this big bonus in terms of cash that you're pulling in each turn for producing. Uh, so this actually reduces that effect a great deal. TNT and Hitler's War follows kind of... Uh, uh, a model where just whatever territories you own is what you get in cash. Um, TNT follows that same model, but a little a little mixed mixed in. Well, conquering works, but it uses a system that's more like World in Flames. You don't have individual factories. What you have is population, resources, and industry. Population and resources are all printed on the board, and you own them, and that's what you get. And industry is something you develop within your country. And you end up scoring whatever the least of the three is, which I think sort of cuts the Gordian knot of the problem that Sal Aston was talking about in Unconditional Surrender. Uh, and sometimes I say, well, while I was playing Triumph and Tragedy, I was kind of thinking... You know, this is almost as silly a game as Hitler's War in terms of the historical accuracy of it, and there's some real problems with it. But I think there are also some glimmers of things that it actually manages effectively. Uh, so, for example, with diplomacy, some of the cards will have countries that were historically opposed to one another on the same card. So you have a choice. Do I play it for Turkey or do I play it for Greece? Do I play it for Bulgaria or Romania? Um, baked into that system. Okay. Uh, trying to think what I have and haven't hit. So I haven't hit the combat system on Triumph and Tragedy. It's a fairly complex uh, buckets of dice derivative. What hap uh, and kind of like Axis and Allies, actually. What, what happens is each type of unit has a capability, it's able to roll a number of dice equal to its strength, and it has a capability to hit each other type of unit, um, and that's all assessed on a unit-by-unit -unit basis. So, for example, air forces are good at shooting down other air forces, but not good at shooting anything else down. So it's not quite as simple as Axis and Allies there. And boy, there's the game that I should be talking about. I don't have my box here, but that is one that I should be looking at. Uh, what I haven't looked at, obviously, things like The War. Uh, 
I've heard good things about it. You know, I feel like my table is full enough of grand strategic World War II. All right. So what's good at what? And let's start going through them. All right. Let's start with our origins of World War II. So this is a good four-player game. It's a lousy five-player game. It's fun for maybe 20 minutes um, every now and then. <laughs> That's about all I can say that you want to do with Origins. No. <laughs> okay. Um, let's start working elsewhere. How about Hitler's War? Hitler's War is really, really silly. You're not going to get a detailed uh, treatment of World War II in this, and you're also not going to get a believable one. Uh, especially on the military level, things just don't work. There's some really clever ideas, but there's some weird implications of the technology on it. So, for example, if uh, the Germans don't bomb the Brits, they don't get the Brits to raise their air defense value, right? Uh, their technology for that. So then it's more expensive for the Germans to build their, uh, their air defenses. And they could lose the war because they didn't bomb the Brits because that means they won't be prepared for the bombing attacks that will come to them. Uh, something along those lines. That's how, how I read it. Um, it was about the only way you could play out the whole war uh, other than Axis and Allies. Axis and Allies is not... Axis and Allies is probably more believable than Hitler's war, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> and it may be more believable than some of the things in the next one, Triumph and Tragedy. What is this? Well, this is just a hell of a lot of fun. Um, for me... This totally supplants whatever Hitler's War was going to give. Except I don't want to get rid of Hitler's War because it has cool things to it. Uh, but uh, with the combination of going far back to 36 to begin with uh, and playing out uh, through the war at a fairly light level, I think this really does a sweet job. In terms of any kind of historical accuracy, I'm not sure there's anything here, but there may be some stuff hiding in it, in, in the ways that I've talked about. All right. Whew. Next in my series, the old Third Reich was kind of cool because it fit on a small table. The current flavorings of these, first of all, Gathering Storm. If you're not using it to link to a world at war, forget about it. I mean, seriously. This thing is just a mess. The rules are terribly written. It might be an okay game, but you're better off playing Triumph and Tragedy if, that's, if, if you just want something for that prequel. It does try to be more historically accurate. There's no question about that. Um, it's a more interesting game standalone than Days of Decision. Uh, I, I won't dispute that either. Days of Decision isn't a lot of fun. There's this horror. If you play Days of Decision alone, there's this horrible bidding process for the military conflicts that I just really despise, and I can't recommend that at all. Um, unfortunately, unless they rewrite the rules for Gathering Storm, um, I can't really suggest it. Uh, but if you're into World at War and you want the prequel to it and you don't care the fact that it doesn't handle the Pacific and you'll be starting in 39, um, it's probably worth investigating. One thing about it, it doesn't seem to be as capable of breaking the follow-up game as Days of Decision is. It, I, I played a maximal Axis victory in Gathering Storm and still felt like I had an interesting game of World War I. It may not have been one that the Axis could lose, but it was still interesting. Okay. This may be my favorite, this combination here at this era of the World War II games. Which might, it certainly was up until I played this. 
<laughs> not because this supplanted it, but because this convinced me it was so overburdened that maybe, uh, you know, among other things, I hadn't gotten a chance to play World in Flame Solitaire. I hadn't gotten a chance to play these newer games back when I played this and fell in love with it. But this system was so cool. Um, the Third Reich system with some additional uh, valuable and, and, and nice details to it, uh, including the technological research, the diplomacy, stuff that other games weren't covering at all. I mean, WIF was not covering that stuff. It still doesn't cover technology really in a good way, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Rising Sun added a naval system that is really good for detail. This one just took it too far, as far as I'm concerned. Now, there's a group of people who came from these guys and are now playing a world at war because it is their, you know, their grand game and that's what they want to want to be doing and that that's fine. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not going to disparage against somebody choosing one game over another. I, it is a valid game, and it actually manages um, to really keep World War II um, on track in a lot of ways. It limits your decisions. It's not the sandbox, and that's the thing. You want the big sandbox, you're going to want this sucker. At least the world in flame side of it. You may want days of decision. That's a bigger sandbox because it allows you to explore um, the pre-war and early starts and late starts and all kind of stuff like that. So I actually really, really like um, I liked what I got out of Days of Decision and World of Flames. Of course, all of these games I grouse terribly while I'm playing them, especially now. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think uh, I think World in Flames beats out a World at War. I can't tell you whether or not I still like Advanced Third Reich, Empire of the Rising Sun better than Whiff. Uh, but when you add Days of Decision to it as a, a unified thing, Days of Decision just as this wrapper around World in Flames, um, I feel like I have something very good there. It allows me to do diplomacy. That's something that wasn't going on over in, you know, the World in Flames world before. So that's all important to me. This one is probably the best of the of the um, really competitive games. It it abstracts away a lot of stuff, but it really, really hits you home with a situation where you're never going to be completely out of it. Now, you could say, well, geez, what if I made some really bad decisions, etc. Yeah, um, the way it sets the timer on it, uh, victory is determined basically by a timer based on situations of when you went to war with Russia and stuff like that. The way it sets that it kind of makes it difficult um, to completely throw yourself out of the game. It's not like it rewards bad play or doesn't penalize it. It's just that it does keep you in the game in a competitive sense. My worry with this one is that there might be some way of gaming that design to be able to allow yourself some sort of cheaper victory than maybe you should have. Let's see if we can get this on. And finally, what about these guys? What do they serve? Um, I think they give you a somewhat looser view along the same level of abstraction that unconditional surrender gives you. A somewhat looser in the sense that you have a little bit more of a sandbox. You have a little bit more of an ability to play things, um, to, to do things a little bit um, 
to do things in a going more off the rails. What I saw though here what, that kind of worries me was you have this limited deck of cards and they really script what you can and can't do. You will be playing World War II um, and you'll be playing it in Unconditional Surrender. Unconditional Surrender allows you to go east first but you still feel like you're playing World War II in a very very uh, concrete way. The games that feel like you're not playing World War II, well, in some ways, World in Flames with Days of Decision comes the closest to allowing you enough freedom to say you're not, you're, you're going beyond the parameters of World War II by a lot. Uh, I think Axis Empires probably comes pretty close to that too, though. Uh, depending on, even though it, it limits you with these cards, um, you still have a, a lot of open choices to make in it. So anyway, uh, every single one of these has its place in my mind. Um, <coughs> Hitler's War has probably fallen into the obsolete category. Um, the reason is, it is really kind of too complicated for what it is facing against, you know, in terms of the, the play, not, not the difficulty of your decisions in play, but the difficulty of the mechanical aspects for what looks like such a light game. Uh, the rules lookups for naval uh, operations and such, and it, it all gets a little too complicated. On the other hand, it goes into more detail than Triumph and Tragedy does. It just it's wrong detail, <laughs> you know? It's just weird. It, it does things that are just totally unbelievable. And I find Triumph and Tragedy believable except for a few little things like, hey, it's a strategic level block game. I don't know whether you got boats, planes, forts, whatever there. And that's kind of disturbing uh, to me. I also don't know the size of the force in Britain. You know, this is all information that you should largely have uh, knowledge of uh, without, you know, having to worry about it. But anyway, uh, almost all of these are, I think, really excellent choice, choices of games. There's other ones out there that people speak well of. The old ETO, uh, which went to, uh, PTO got built after it. Uh, the war, which I think may be derived from that. Uh, there's a Clash of Arms one. I, they, there's just so many, many out there that I can't, I can't touch on them all. Um, but a lot of different options, and I think all of them, you know, have their own special, uh, their own little place that that keeps them of some value uh, to the to someone who's really interested in. In, in, in strategic World War II. All right, we'll send this up. Uh, I doubt that it gives you the information you need, but maybe it'll give you, you know, a spark to go look at where I'm actually looking at the games in detail instead of trying to remember what I thought about them five years ago.